Hey, what's up, tribe? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the TFC Audio Project Down Under. This week, I'm joined again by Tom Williams from Breath Performance Physio to chat all about breathing for running. Throughout the episode, we talk through the principles of efficient running technique, how proper breathing facilitates this efficiency, and how conventional footwear can disrupt it, as well as the importance of a gradual transition and self-regulation along the way. This week's episode is brought to you by TFC Footwear. Finding the right... Sh- this week's episode is brought to you by TFC Footwear. Finding the right shoes that let feet be feet can be tough, especially in a world where fashion is favoured over function. We get it. The best pair for you is a pair you're actually going to wear. That's why we now have a full range of barefoot shoes for any occasion, whether you're running, hiking, or just looking for something casual. And to say thanks for supporting the TFC Audio Project Down Under, we want to offer a special discount to our listeners. Use the code 5OFF, that's F-I-V-E-O-F-F, at checkout to save 5%. The code and a link to our footwear range is in the show notes. All right, Tom, welcome back to the podcast, mate. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me, James. Your, your third appearance, and uh, I think we're just going to have to make it a, a more and more regular thing, really. I'm um, right. You're racking up a cricket score. <laughs> Looking to get myself into the 50s. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll get there one day. Um, so, yeah, the two previous episodes have been on breathing and sleep, um, both of which are definitely worth listening to if you haven't, to or if you haven't already, um, especially the breathing one, because we'll be drawing like using that essentially as a bit of a foundation for this one which is going to be all about breathing for running um so i'm pretty excited for this one because i've been getting more into running lately i've never been a like a huge runner really myself except for in grade seven when we had a kilometer club did you did you have a kilometer club yeah no i've never heard of a kilometer it's basically you just you run laps around the oval and each lap there's like parent volunteers standing there and they, they put like a mark on your arm, like a tally with um, <laughs> whiteboard marker and you get a tally and you divide that by four and that's how many kilometers you did in that day and then it's like a leaderboard. Sounds like a way the PE teacher yeah. just got the, the parents to do all the work and you've got to sit down and have a watch. Pretty much. Well, it was in the morning. Yeah, it was in the mornings before before school and... Um, actually I quite enjoyed it. There's something about like the sort of friendly competition where there's so many people down there just running around the oval. It got, it got pretty cool. And then like, there was like a, a leaderboard and I think there was some kind of prize if you won, but, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Yeah. it was, it was pretty cool. I don't know if my school was the only one to do it. No, we had jump rope for heart. Which was, uh, yeah, okay. which is mostly what we did. Like they would practice for the months leading up to it because you needed a little bit of endurance to skip for X number of yeah. minutes. And then you'd practice skipping on the grass and on the concrete. Yeah, Got right. really into it actually for some reason. And then you go around town and get like money donations from people and show them right. you're skipping and stuff. So that was pretty cool, but yeah. no, no running club. Kilom- yeah, well, kilometer club was... Yeah, it was, and I got I got quite fit actually. I don't remember my soccer got way better when I started getting fitter. Funnily enough, <laughs> it's like magic, that right? Yeah. Clockwork, <laughs> ta da! <laughs> um, but it, but since then, yeah, like I haven't really been much of a runner, but I've been getting into it a lot more lately. Just just for the purpose of being a, a more well rounded human. <laughs> really. Yeah, and it's a fun activity. And yeah, I think because. You and I sort of, again, if anyone doesn't know, we, we live pretty close, so we often see each other in the mornings or... Literally next door. Yeah, and if we, you know one of us is running the other one, it's just a little bit of motivation. And this is where, like, because we both have Strava, mm. it does sort of help a little bit. It's like, all right, someone else has gone for a run. Do I feel like I want to run? Yes. Do I have the motivation? Yes. All right, I'm out the door. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Mind you, Strava, I've got a bone to pick with Strava. Oh, damn. <laughs> we've, we've been running uh, along the river uh, obviously, because we live right next to the river in Brisbane. For in those Brisbane, who don't know, yeah, along the Brisbane River, and it seems to it seems like when you get to the bridges at the river point, Strava messes up and it adds about a kilometer to my run or adds something to my run without changing the time, obviously. Oh. And so my pace is like way faster than it than it should be. Um, and it seems like only when I go onto that bridge, which is really annoying. Cause Are you I, used I, using your phone to track yeah, your running? Yeah, my phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Why, cause I, I, I use a Garmin watch and then it uh, uploads from Garmin to Strava and there's no problem. Uh, I was like to say, I, I'm just trying to think if that ever happened and no, uh, it hasn't. So I'm going to have to get a Garmin or yeah. I just avoid the bridge area. <laughs> run to the bridge, run back. <laughs> yeah. Well, if anyone has any insights on how to deal with that with Strava, let us know. Mm, but oh, Sneaky Strava. Bloody Strava. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm getting inaccurate data. Mm. But anyway... Long story short, I'm very keen for this because I've been getting into running. I'm actually quite enjoying it and 
um, at first was really struggling with the breathing aspect, but have dialed, been dialing that in over the last few weeks and I've actually noticed a big improvement already in, in my pace and distance and everything. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So um, this will this podcast will obviously be important if you are a runner, um, breathing for running, but also the principles we'll talk about should apply to pretty much any activity that you do as well and, and even just daily life. So I reckon we'll just start by chatting through a bit of the basics on breathing just in case... Someone hasn't listened to the first one, but obviously go and listen to that. Um, yeah. But it's good to just set the scene and then uh, we'll get into the running stuff as well. So, right, you're cool. the breath man. Uh, I, I'm the breath man. <laughs> I am the breath guy or diaphragm dude. We, we, any word you want to put. <laughs> All right. So, like James said, I think yeah, going back and listening to the first one probably covers everything that we're about to say, but we'll try and keep this sort of short and sweet with it. If we all remember back... What we're trying to do early on with your breathing is to try and optimize the efficiency effectively. And the best way that we know to do that is nasal diaphragmatic breathing. So what that means is breathe in and out through your nose is the first part. And then diaphragmatically means breathing down low sort of into your stomach. So again, traditionally within yoga, they talk about belly breathing, which kind of gets it, but not the full thing. Something we spoke about in that last podcast is like the Superman 360, trying to Breathe down and let your diaphragm drop down and expand in that full 360. Now, why is that important and why is it going to help you with efficiency? As we touched on, like the nose has a lot of benefits. It humidifies the air. It gets rid of the pollutants that are coming in. It has the nitric oxide in the nasal cavity, which helps to open up the pathway. And then you've got this capacity to let the air sort of filter through your nose and through the nasal conca. So it has longer time to heat up, longer time to humidify. So it's, it becomes just a more efficient pathway overall. And, you know, there's up to 30 odd benefits of breathing through your nose that you don't quite get through your mouth. So that's the first and probably the most vital point to all of it. And then as for the diaphragm part, realistically, it's a numbers game. If your diaphragm does more of the job, then the blood that goes there it's going to your diaphragm, not all the accessory muscles. So you're not using as much energy and the rest of the body can use it to what it needs. Because mm. your diaphragm's made to be breathing all day, every day. And it's it's made to be the primary breathing muscle. Everything else is secondary. Yeah. So and then, like, you might find it's some... Not, it's not different breathing styles. It's not like, mm. oh, he just breathes like this and I breathe like that. So diaphragm is the primary muscle. And I, the, the only caveat to it, I suppose, is that you will find in different books, different textbooks, different research papers that you might see like the scalenes or like your SEM or something up and around your neck is also a primary breathing muscle just with the way it helps to stabilize the upper rib cage. Right. But for the purpose of like the understanding, your diaphragm is the one that should be doing most of the job. Mm. It's got the biggest area to do it. And it's got the best position to do it. And it has so many other effects outside of just movement efficiency. Mm. And the good thing is nasal breathing also promotes diaphragmatic breathing. So if, 100%. You, if you focus on nasal breathing, that'll be the biggest thing. And then obviously working on some diapher- like diaphragm focused mm. training can be helpful if you, if you need to. And that's why it's really easy to always sort of start with the basics. So whether you're on your stomach or on your back with your knees bent up and feet are flat, really just trying to hone in with your tongue pressed against the roof of the mouth breathing in and out through your nose at a speed that you feel comfortable with at the first sort of instance, you just get that sense of what it feels like to be able to do it. And it's often what I do in clinic with most people because you want to set the baseline. Your body, your nervous system needs to know, oh, that's how I'm breathing. That's what's easy. Because once we start manipulating the position, the variables, what you end up finding is, hell, this is a bit harder. And then mm. particularly as we get more vertical to gravity, the, gra- the effect of gravity, sorry, yeah, it becomes more difficult. Mm. And it's just, again, gravity does that. That's what yeah. it does. Yeah. And the other thing that's worth pointing out, like you said, di- the diaphragm isn't just about breathing efficiency, but it does form a, a big part of our core function as well. And core function is obviously super important for the rest of the body function. Well, I see. Like it has such an interaction with your abdominals as a big part. It has such a huge interaction with your heart. It has a huge interaction with your gastrointestinal system. So, mm. and like that's just to name a few of the parts that it does. So once you look into it, it does seem to make sense that the better you can make that, and the better the, the movement is, the more efficient the movement is. Uh, yes, your core is better, but the rest of the body seems to respond to that in most often a positive way yeah and we really need to think about our breathing as our foundational movement for anything whatever movement skill you're doing whether it's walking or running or squatting or 
climbing or whatever it is, then... Handstands. Handstands. Well, especially <laughs> handstands, really. Um, breathing is the foundational movement behind it all. And if you're not breathing efficiently or breathing well while you're doing a certain movement, then you're leaving performance on the table, really. And performance it's pretty and, much as simple as that. And it's something that you and I have talked about, performance and health. And health, yeah. Like, yeah, they sometimes are two separate things, but they should very much go hand in hand for to form the basis, to form like the base of anything that you do. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think that's a good recap of what we went through last time. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I think maybe something that's worth talking about as well is just the effect of nasal breathing and diaphragmatic breathing on your the state of your nervous system um in that you know can, it's your breath is really that conduit between your voluntary and involuntary nervous system so the autonomic nervous system is broken down into parasympathetic and sympathetic which is fight or flight and rest or digest whoops sorry fight and flight or rest and digest and your breathing the way you breathe the cadence and yeah, the, the pattern of breathing can really influence the state of your nervous system, which is super important. Yeah, 100%. And when you're out running, it's sort of, you know, if we take it back to running, there's so, three sort of tiers. You've got thinking about your breathing, thinking about your movement, or just effectively not thinking and looking at the environment as you take it in. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they get caught up, particularly thinking about how they're moving, and it really constrains the system. And you find that sort of becomes more stressful for the person and then the experience of running becomes less enjoyable and that's not what we want we want people to enjoy running now Mm. granted again the caveat is some people might not be ready to go out and do a 5 or 10k that's why there are things like couch to 5k or these other running programs which we'll sort of discuss Mm. to help people get to that point but at the end of the day you want to enjoy the experience and if you can put your nervous system in less fight or flight and put it into like you know i'm a bit calmer i'm gonna go out there more often than not, you will enjoy the run more because you're feeling more relaxed mm. and you're moving more efficiently. So then all of a sudden you feel less fatigued and the whole experience of running becomes more enjoyable. That's an interesting segue, which I just thought of. I guess running from an evolutionary point of view usually would be uh, tied with some kind of stressful event, like whether it's hunting or escaping a predator, like the actual act of running is probably probably predisposes you to that more fight or flight state of the nervous system so it's it's pretty much breathing that would allow you to stay like it is breathing that would allow you to stay relaxed because most people would default to that mouth breathing (gasps) just puffing and and Mm. so on but you, you can vastly increase your distance and efficiency through changing that hey and it's quite interesting that you mentioned that because when you think about it, they're often probably historically they were either chasing something to you know from the hunter gatherer perspective or running away from something. Mm. But particularly when they're running towards something, they want to be switched on but alert and yeah, present. True. And there's a difference between that sensation and running away for your dear life, where you're kind of yeah. panicking. <laughs> I think that's where it comes into. It makes sense to try and run with a purpose or intent and trying to be calm and present with it mm. versus I'm going to go run. I'm just going to be stressed. I'm going to hate the whole thing. Yeah. Cause often you find like, for example, people will use exercise and particularly running is a good one to get rid of the stress of their day. They know it calms them down. And th- th- I think there's a lot of reasons that we probably don't understand why, mm. but it's a good reliever. Yeah. And I guess that's the difference between, yeah, like the persistence hunting version of, running and the sprint the hell away from mm. this saber tooth tiger i don't want the tiger to bite my leg off <laughs> yeah pretty much and yeah like obviously back in the day people aren't just going out for runs for the sake of running because it doesn't make any sense well but, it's energy right it's all about energy yeah. like efficiency there you don't want to expend energy when you don't need it and yeah when you need it you want to be able to have it yeah but they did have to run as a matter of survival which is why we evolved such an amazing running machine <laughs> mm, exactly we yeah. are effectively running machines yeah well we're the best runners on the planet really not mm. the fastest but we're the most efficient well and have the best endurance mm. like there's nothing that can really outlast us i'm pretty sure there is nothing that can outlast us in an endurance race but when it comes to speed yeah look we're not close but <laughs> not, that's not all right we don't close. worry about that we worry about running for a long period of time exactly so speaking of that obviously we have evolved uh, an amazingly efficient running machine um and basically efficient is just using you know get, getting the best performance or the most endurance with the minimal 
well, obviously, the be- I'll just say best performance. Um, in this case, endurance for uh, humans are the well, best endurance. Well, as I say, probably like a really said. good way to phrase it and how I tell efficiency means better performance from the sake of energy. Yeah. Right. You're using less energy to perform at a higher level. Yeah. Which when you break that down, what that ends up going to, it means your brain can do other things. Yeah. It's why you see the elite performers, they look very calm because they're very fit. They've got a lot of other good things like their balance system, eye system, but effectively, they're just using a lot less conscious effort and energy to do the task required. Exactly, yeah. So best performance for the least amount of energy. And I think I would also add on to that just the least amount of undue strain on the muscles and joints, like which all is obviously heavily interrelated, um, but you don't want to be just running. It's just not, it's not efficient. Even if you're not using much energy, it's not efficient if you're then putting heaps of strain on your muscles and joints. So it needs to be efficient from that standpoint as well. Well, You want your body to move as efficiently as it can and everyone's movement will be slightly different. But like you said, we're evolved from evolution from millions of years. There are certain characteristics that seem to transcend across people for the most part. And just for sake, it's more like able-bodied people who don't have like any sort of limb length deformities or, mm. or happen to have lost a leg in an accident by chance. Like when we look at just people who are born and they start running, there's a lot of similar characteristics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you do see a lot of different running styles. Um, say say on our walks along the river. The egg beat is my personal favorite. <laughs> we, we see all different types of running styles and it is it's it's a really fascinating thing because it is not really many places that you would walk along that would have that many people running basically it's this river riverside expressway basically where there's heaps of cyclists and heaps of runners and it's a beautiful place to run and hence why we run there and walk there um but gee you see some crazy styles and I think most people are under the impression of like, oh, that's just how that person runs. That's just their running style. And, that, you know, and yes, they might be, this is that sort of difference between effectiveness and efficiency. Like they might be effectively running. Like, yes, they are technically running and they might even be able to effectively cover a long distance at a, at a good pace. But does that mean it's efficient? Not necessarily. Yeah. And that, and that, like, it's a very big talking point because, the premise to everything that we're probably going to talk about, you and I are big on efficiency and saving energy where possible, but that might not be the case for every person. Like they might not want to get super efficient. They might be happy with being effective. And that's where when you start to teach and educate people, it's entirely up to them, the choice that they want to make if they want to change to a more efficient pattern. Mm. It does have its pros and cons per se in the short term, but in the long term, it's very, very much a pro to be able to run more efficient. And if you want to get a really good example the women's triathlon winner, um, which I think happened two days ago, three days ago. If anyone wants to go watch that Olympics, weapon, absolute beast. Efficiency, stride, just calm. And by the end of it, particularly watch her after the race, she looks fine. Mm, like mm. she, she's actually like laughing when third place comes in like and they hug and it's like, <laughs> wow, you're very fit. <laughs> very impressive. But yeah, it's, it's amazing to just see the efficiency that comes with like the way she strikes the ground and her movement is so like repetitious. It just looks yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. And if you look at any high level runner or if you look at, you know, say a, a cohort of really high level runners, then they all pretty much run in the same way. You don't see this big ver- variability like we see on the river. Mm. <laughs> like obviously there's small little small bits of variability and and kind of different slightly different styles but in essence it's the same pattern because that is what an efficient running pattern looks like and you don't really get to that level without refining an efficient running technique and like you said you can choose whether or not you want to try and change it and it is a little bit uncomfortable to try and change a running technique or it takes it takes work to try and address technique and it may feel weird at first because it's not what you're used to, but it does feel a lot better when you actually do change your technique and you do work on it and then you realize, oh, I can run faster for longer and I recover better the next day. That's the, the key part. I think particularly when I went through that process myself of trying to change my running style for my distance running, it was the recovery. Like the next day, it's like, oh, 
I don't feel as sore. Mm. I feel like I could actually go for another run, like slept really well. Mm. Whereas I think most people who are runners have experienced the slog run where you get out for 5k, you just, you pump as fast as you can, you feel knackered, you go to bed, you wake up and you know that you, you put a fair bit of a shift in. And then it's not what you're always after. Periods of the year, periods of the week might be useful, but most people I treat in clinic are doing that way too often. They're going out for their four or five runs a week and they're just threshold, threshold, threshold. Pound in the pavement. <laughs> and it's, it, I mean, when you break it down, I think most people kind of come to their own realization pretty quickly. Like, yeah, it doesn't actually make sense to do that, does it? No. <laughs> it, it just seems, it seems hard on the body. It's hard on the mind. It's hard to come back into the real world and transition away from like the exercise because you're feeling more stressed. Yeah. That's where it becomes a stress promoter rather than a stress reliever Mm. yeah and then people feel like oh i have to go for a run because it's my exercise and it's um you know it's how i make up for all the food i ate over the weekend or or whatever they Mm. they treat it like an exercise chore rather than like a a movement skill that's enjoyable to explore yeah so that's that's a pretty key mindset to change um but in terms of efficiency with running we'll just touch on a couple of important points so first one overstriding Oof. that's that's the the demon mm. of running really. don't do it <laughs> don't do it don't do it um so that just basically means your foot is striking the ground far like way too out way too far out in front of your center of mass mm. and that means that you're essentially putting on the brakes the yeah. whole time it's all uh, uh, running is constant falling and if you're always putting the brakes on you're going to take more energy because you're going to have to absorb more force and that's not often ideal because then you have to propel forward again. When you're trying to get that efficient pattern, the closer your foot lands towards you, now it, it's never going to land directly under you. Reason is, if that happens, you're probably going to fall over. Yeah, It's always going to be slightly in front and that's normal, but you want it and everyone will be different, different limb lengths, different like trunk lengths. It'll always vary a little bit and that's where the variation in technique comes. But closer, the better for the most part. Yeah. Right, and I think that's a very important point. Some people will be slightly different. That's okay, but if you're long stride, heel striking, that's a lot of energy that you're going to have to be using to take every step. Yeah, it's a lot of energy, and it's also a lot of impact that is not actually your body's not actually made to deal with that impact in running, especially with heel striking. And really, the only reason most people heel strike like that and overstride and heel strike is because of cushioned heeled running shoes, right? I'm going to say it's the only reason. It's, it's the only I, reason. I don't see any other reason why you would land on your heel. Like, and we were laughing about this before we started. Like, if anyone wants to try it, stand up, try and jump and land on your heels. Don't do a big jump. Yeah. Wild barefoot. Yeah. Wild barefoot. On concrete. Yeah. On, on concrete. <laughs> start, start on the carpet, maybe. Actually, yeah. Don't go straight to concrete. Not on the concrete. And you'll, and you'll feel it straight away. It's a jolt up the body. It hurts because your fat pad under your heel is very innovated. So it's got a lot of receptors that send to the, the spinal cord, which can signal for pain. And look, it's, it's going to hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So heel striking is good for walking. We can handle that amount of load and that's that's the correct or the efficient um, pattern. Uh, but yeah, it's isn't running six to eight times our body weight basically with each with each step. Yeah, depending so, on speed and yeah, like the, the limb lengths and like each part of your body takes on a little bit more or less load depending on yeah how you're hitting the floor. Yeah. So. So yeah, it's basically a lot more and we need to absorb that force through our muscles and tendons basically rather than our skeletal yeah. system. <laughs> and, and I think that the, the reason for it is not because you know, James or I are saying, hey, that's the f- most efficient way. When you look at the physiology, we have this thing called the stretch shortening cycle. We have all these elastic components in our body which are very well designed to accept force like that when we land more on that sort of foot, mid to forefoot. And through a lot of research and a lot of just like observation, it seems to be the most efficient way to dissipate the force up the chain. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we, we look at it from evolution, we look at the function, and then we test it against something else and realize heel striking is not as efficient for any of that whilst running. Yeah. So the yeah exactly, and especially overstriding. Like you can you can still forefoot or midfoot strike while overstriding, mm. but pretty much all heel striking will tend to be overstriding. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, like you said, the, f- the foot and the Achilles and the calf and, you know, and the knee, like they, we ha- have these stretch shortening cycles where it'll absorb force and then it'll, like a spring, it'll take that force and then, 
use it that use it basically yeah. without actually you having to use as much muscular force so it's the tendons are actually producing a lot of that yeah. elastic energy yeah that's a really good analogy get a rubber band pull it let it go and every time it lets go is that effectively you're loading it you're letting it go yeah and it means that you're not using your energy through the muscular effort to go forward and that's why running for the people who don't run who are listening to this people talk about runners high or like feeling in the zone and stuff it often comes because you feel very efficient and you almost it's almost very meditative to be honest mm-hmm. you become mm-hmm. one with the body because it's not an effort whereas you see the people who are overstriding heel striking wearing the bulky shoes mouth breathing, mouth breathing <laughs> panting looking like they're about to pass out they never they, they can't enjoy it because they're not necessarily having a good time at all from yeah. any aspect yeah it looks painful it, it actually looks hard yeah and it kind of hurts my eyes <laughs> yeah and so in order to utilize those tendon springs <clears throat> then you obviously need to have some basic capacity in your tendons and mm. so doing things like slow calf raises and decline squats and and just improving those the the capacity of those tendons to tolerate load is really important um, but then also using them in that capacity things like skipping and hopping and things like that that actually train your body to use that elastic energy or to utilize those mechanisms to produce that elastic energy yeah and that, i mean this is a great spot to shout out for tom yeah now, mechanics, shout out. Yeah, yeah mechanics by <laughs> movement for movement Mechanics of movement. Yeah, of movement. I forgot it again. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. But so if you've uh, not come across his page, I would highly recommend going to have Definitely, a look because yeah. he puts up a lot of good strength exercises, plyometric exercises that are very specific for runners. He did it like a whole last few months have been very much strength training for runners and highly would recommend it because I think it's great content. Yeah. And he's a great dude. Yeah. And he's got he's also got a running biomechanics presentation mm. um, that I found really great. Like we, we learned about it in uni, but I hadn't really sort of delved very deeply into it since then. Um, but like I said, I've been getting more into it lately and we go through it in our seminars. And so doing that, I was like, Oh, this is, this is really good stuff. It's good. good it's good to know it, whether you're a practitioner or even just someone who's a runner, like it's, it's good stuff to be aware of the biomechanics of the body. And, and it's, and and how it's it not applies. hard either, yeah. is it? Like when someone explains it well, it becomes very simple. And then you sort of, you get those markers yourself, particularly as a non-physician person going, oh, what am I supposed to do? Get simple cues, simple things to do. And like, oh, I know what I'm trying to achieve now. That's all you need to know for the yeah. most part. Like if you knew, for example, that it's less efficient to do heel striking, then as we'll talk about, how do I get away from it, right? As, yeah. as we go through the rest of it, it'll make more sense. But those are the sorts of things that are practical. You don't need to know all of the physiology at all. You just yeah. need to know, how can I do it? Yeah, exactly. And it informs you about, yeah, like you said, okay, heel striking isn't as efficient or, you know, just being aware that, oh, I need to not be overstriding. Just being aware that there is an efficient (laughs) style of running um, and that you may not be doing it. (laughs) Uh, But then it also informs you, okay, well, what what ranges of motion and what positions do I need to be strong in? And this is why strength training can be so beneficial for running because there are certain positions and ranges of motion that you do need to be strong and balanced in and if you test those positions or movements and you realize that you're not strong in there then likelihood is you're leaving performance on the table while you're running and probably exposing yourself to a greater risk of injury simple word prerequisites yeah like running is a skill like any other skill you wouldn't just go you know outright and bench as much as you think you could you wouldn't go do it for a squat but people go out and just do a run for as long as they can and assume it's different Now, yes, in one sense, evolutionarily, we are designed to run. But if you haven't run in a long time or running's new to you, then it's still a skill that you have to either relearn or develop. Exactly. And this is is a big thing that I always talk about is, yeah, there's this temptation to think of like, oh, running's just a natural movement and that means I can just go out for a run whenever I want. And this is what most people do. They're like, oh, I want to get fit. I'll just start running. And it's like, you haven't run probably since you were in primary school and you was just, you've just been sitting, you've been sitting in chairs, like you've lost the capacity mm. that your body needs in order to have a good, efficient running style. And you've lost, you know, key ranges of motion, you've lost balance, you've lost strength. And that is going to show up in a lot of compensations 
through the chain and it's not going to be efficient and that's why we see all of these running styles along the river. It's actually a really, you, I think you worded it really well. Like we see so many compensations and so this is where I think a few years ago within the physio, exercise physiology world, it was sort of got debated like, look, people can run in a certain way and they might not get hurt and they may never get hurt and we can never prove one might hurt you and one might not mm, hurt you. Exactly, yeah. What we can show you is like there seems to be a more energy efficient way to do it the reason we can't say one or the other is the gold, gold, gold standard is because life is like a factor. You got your other stresses, family, food, sleep, nutrition, how good everything else moves to really factor it in. But what we're trying to suggest and educate on is that if you can minimize the impact of the running and, and try to optimize it effectively, your body will respond better. You will then have one less stressor mm -hmm. in, in the day and it then becomes a lot more enjoyable. And if, you know, we, we often we look at play as a really good way of getting people active, right? If running became more of a sort of a playing event or a, a fun event and it wasn't so tedious and stressful and pounding the pavement, as you said, it seems like that would be very good for a lot of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And yeah. And, and just really acknowledging that it's a skill and skills can be super enjoyable. And the way you learn a skill is through play. And not by going, okay, I just have to run this amount. It's like, oh, I want to explore. Okay, I've learned that there's a maybe a different technique, that uh, like a more efficient technique. Let me explore this movement. Let me and and obviously it, there's a lot of factors that are involved. Uh, and actually, something I wanted to touch on just then, mm. like you said, maybe this particular efficient technique, we can't say definitively. Oh, that will solve your pain, or it will uh, prevent injuries, or or whatever, but we can say it'll improve your performance because, I mean, that's that's the whole definition of efficiency. And the research backs it up. And research backs that, it up, And that's yeah. the good part. Like, the research, like, the easiest example would be if you're wearing heavy, bulky shoes, they, they have weight to them. And now if we have weight, that means we're going to need more energy to put the foot forward at every step. And that means you're going to use more oxygen. Yeah. Now, if you get into a minimalist shoe, the shoe that has a lot less weight, in it and like those bulky ASIC shoes for example it's no offense to ASIC just the first one that came to mind it's like 260 odd grams 280 grams versus a minimalist shoe which is like I don't even know but it's like sub 100 yeah and it seems to not affect your your body's natural capacity to run if your shoe is like that sort of light so you're not really adding any extra load to it mm. and that there is well if I'm going to use more oxygen and energy then that has to be less efficient yeah and also the fact that a cushioned heel allows you to heel strike. Like this is the the big benefit I think of switching to barefoot or for to minimalist footwear, is that you'll really get the feedback as to what your striking pattern is like. If you're overstriding and heel striking in bare feet <laughs> or in minimalist footwear, you'll get that feedback pretty much straight away. Whereas if you're if you've got a big cushioned heel, then it kind of takes away that feedback. It's yeah. like it's like like we said the example before. If you jump off a box. Slightly different example, but say you jump off a box and land on the ground and you've got a big mat there versus concrete, then you're going to land very differently or you're going to try and land very differently and it's going to be a different experience. Yeah. And the cushion heel allows that heel striking pattern, which is inefficient, whereas switching to a minimalist or barefoot footwear or just barefoot, then you get that feedback immediately and it kind of self, your body kind of self corrects. Assuming you've got. Um, you know, like we said, the, the prerequisite yeah. mo mobility and strength, then your body should self-organize if it doesn't have things on it that are disrupting <laughs> that that organization. And I suppose to touch on more of that shoe front just really quickly. So I'm very fortunate. I get to treat a lot of runners and like ultra runners in clinic and stuff. And look, for people out there who are really into their running, different shoes are should be used for different things. So for example, if you're on the concrete and you're not used to barefoot running, mm. yeah, having a little bit of cushion is actually very beneficial. But that doesn't mean you have what we call a heel to toe drop which is where the heel is very like chunky and, mm. the, and the, the front is very flat and you're going down because that's, again, not conforming to the efficiency model. You always want to have your foot flat. And yeah. Regardless of if there's a, what we call a stack height or the cushion in there or not, foot flat is uh, imperative. It's a must. Yeah. So, for example, I have about 23 mil stack height in my shoes that I wear on concrete. But if I go on the trails or I, well, if I'm on the trails, I wear Merrell shoes, which are flat and they just have the vibram sole. If I'm on grass, I'm barefoot. Yeah. 
right? So my foot's always flat. The level of cushion is just very dependent. My feet can't tolerate for a long period of time the concrete just yet. So mm. I use the cushion. And that's very important for people to know because there are some prereqs. We can actually put them probably in the show notes if you want. Just some yeah. ideas for people of like how to find the right shoe for them. But effectively, like horses for courses, different shoes at different times of your life, like at, through the age span or lifespan, different like environments. Like you wouldn't necessarily want to wear a, a jogger to play soccer. Mm. You'd want a soccer boot. Yeah. So it is important to know that there are that variation, but there are some key, again, some key like principles that you can look for the shoe that's going to best suit you at the moment and then see how you go across six to 12 months and whether or not you need to update or change the shoe for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah, and the way you run is generally the more the more important factor than the actual shoe you're mm. running in. But the shoe you're running in can affect the way you run. And it is, like you said, it's all really down to what your feet are used to and what you can tolerate mm. um, based yeah. on your history and based on your condition. We're not saying that everyone has to go out and, and run barefoot immediately. And I think that's where the whole barefoot shoe movement ran into issues was because people go, oh, cool. Oh, there's barefoot shoe. It's more natural. Okay, sweet. I'll do my usual 10K or 20K in these new shoes and I won't address, I won't change my technique. And then Um, stress fracture. And then boom, stress fracture, you know, tendinopathies, you name it. And it gave everyone or gave, especially podiatrists and the rest of the footwear industry a great excuse to say, oh, these are terrible for your body. It's like, no, the shoes aren't terrible for your body. It's the extreme increase in load and volume that your body was not ready for. Progressive overload and the law of specificity still apply in this world. Strength and conditioning is still very important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I guess to summarize all of that would be to play with your running technique, understand that heel striking and especially overstriding will be affecting that. Um, or will be basically destroying your efficiency. Um, strength and conditioning for some key areas, um, and that would include using your tendon springs and things like skipping and hopping. Yeah. And I think there's a lot. Because, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, it's really hard. Like it's hard. I'm trying to summarize. Yeah, it, but... you can't really summarize the idea of getting balanced strength, coordination, mobility with just you know going. Oh, all right, because there's a lot of things within there, and I think that's where it's good to follow certain people. Yeah. Um, who. Yeah. Oh, often we all have the same like um, ideas and philosophy around it. We just often target different action. Like I target breathing, right? You you guys started targeting feet first, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, we all come to a very similar place. That's yeah. why we are connected, I suppose. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, we'll what we'll do is put some links in the show notes. I reckon, yeah, for people to follow, things to look into, um, to do some more of your own research, but. Um, yeah. yeah, if uh, actual running technique is important, and now we can get into breathing for yeah, running yeah. technique. So, um, yeah, what are the big points of focus for breathing while running? Obviously, well, well, as you know, I like to start from the ground up and work so everyone can follow it sequentially. So, exactly what we said at the start. Um, again, if you go back to listen to the first breathing podcast, there'll be a lot of good exercises to start there. But understand your own breathing pattern first. Get the awareness right. And that is, again, easiest done either on your stomach or lying on your back. You can do it in any position, but you want to give yourself a baseline. So in that position, nasal through your nose, in and out, diaphragmatic, that Superman 360, breathing low and then expanding up through your chest. Once your brain, your nervous system has that sort of standard, that map, then we can start playing with the positions as we go up. Because you want to have the ability to have the lungs expand as much as they can, the rib cage expand as much as it can when you're in standing. I think that's the first bit. So there are progressions, there are sequences from your back or your stomach to your hands and knees to kneeling to squatting to you know double leg standing, tandem stance, and then to a single leg sort of stance. If you can breathe as well as you did on your back in a single leg stance with balance, that's really good. Most people can't. Mm. particularly when they start because their foot is not connected to the hip and the hip's not connected to the pelvis all the way up to the rib cage as efficiently as it could. So therefore, everything gets those, as you said, little compensations, right? So get that baseline first and then practice it in single leg. Why single leg? Running is single leg Mm -hmm. because you're trying to set the the groundwork of, yes, it's not exactly the same as running, particularly if you're on the mid to forefoot, but when you're on that single leg balance, stand on the leg. See if you can put the weight onto the middle of your foot 
and then breathe. And I, I guarantee a lot of people will find that hard. If you find it really easy, then go into more of a running position where one leg's you know on the ground, the other one's up at like 90 degrees, sort of like an A march or an A skip position. Try and breathe there whilst holding it. And again, it's hard, but it's really useful for you and your nervous system to get the idea that I need to be able to expand as well as I can there. And I think that's the very, very starting point. I think if you get that right, a lot of things will start to self-organize around it. Mm -hmm. Back to your point, put the body in the position to do the thing that you're trying to make it do. Yeah. So I think that's step one. Step two is, well, how do I then uh, use that with running? Back to what you talked about. Firstly, we want to be trying to breathe through your nose, both in and out. Now, granted, there'll be some people that have sinus issues or have some changes in the nasal conca or have some windpipe issues during development where they don't, they don't have a big enough windpipe connecting to their nose where it does make those things a little bit harder. And we can talk about that in another podcast or something. But for today's example, breathe through your nose. The majority of people do have the ability. It's, yeah. It may feel weird and uncomfortable at first, but if unless there's like a, a literal structural blockage or some kind of defect. Well, it's the clogged sink analogy we used, right? Yeah. Like it's beautiful. Yeah. And for those who haven't heard that, if you had a clogged sink, you wouldn't just leave it clogged. Yeah. Oh, my sink's just clogged. Yeah. You, you'd find a way to fix it, <laughs> yeah. right? Because it's going to be wreaking havoc. Yeah. Your nose is exactly the same, yeah. okay? So, yeah. So, fix the sink. <laughs> fix And get fix it the nose. Actually, I was literally just chatting to my mate that I went to physio school with. He's in Melbourne, but he's just had a surgery on his nose because he couldn't breathe through his nose properly. I think it was just one nostril mm. couldn't get it through, but he it kept getting delayed, but that's been his whole life, basically. It was some kind of genetic... I can't remember exactly what it was, but he was pretty much born with it. And I'm well, pretty much born. He was born with yeah. it. <laughs> and anyway, he's just got it fixed. And he said it's been an absolute game changer for his sleep and for his training and just energy and health in general. He's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually blown away by the change. So, Which is so cool. It's so cool. To, and that's to where surgery that from and medicine are so cool, right? Yeah. Like that's what the whole point of having medicine was to help make people's lives better when there was accidents or we had problems. Yeah, I then, don't think it was designed to you know, just sit around and, oh, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get a little bit of medicine or something. Yeah. It was, it was well, to help people who needed help. Yeah. And they basically tried to apply emergency con- medicine concepts to lifestyle diseases. And so, yeah, if it's a genetic or an emergency or traumatic thing, then medical and emergency, medicine and emergency and surgeries are amazing. Oh, they're the best. hundred percent. It's like in, insane what they can do. But mm. if you try to apply that system to life, chronic lifestyle diseases, then you're just going to be covering up symptoms basically. Anyway, that's a rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah. But yes, unclog the sink. <laughs> yeah. um, and for most of you listening out here, you might think, oh, my nose is too small, but usually that just is because you haven't been using it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's very true. And again, we, we can touch in more depth on that later, but when people start running, so a lot of what I get them to do in clinic is just to start running and trying it with the nasal breathing. Probably the most common thing I get reported straight away is it burns my nose, right? Yeah. And it, it's like this sort of build up of, it's like a carbon dioxide burn is what it feels like really. And that's probably mean you're running too fast for your own breathing efficiency. Mm-hmm. So within the way I teach people, to, this is mostly dictated or endurance running, so not sprint training because that's a bit different. You want to run in something that we call zone two. And zone two is having a heart rate that's relatively low, relatively constant that you can maintain like talking. So for example, a talk test would be me speaking in full sentences to you whilst we're running or saying 181, 182, 183, 184, 185 comfortably. What that will mean for most people and for anyone who's like an aficionado out there, you're not really getting to your ventilatory or your lactate threshold. So your body is creating metabolic waste and clearing it, which again is a very efficient model. It's not overworking, it's going very perfectly. And as humans, we're, we've got that endurance capacity to run for a very long time. Like that's what we're, that's the hunting, that's that mm. all day hunt to find our dinner. We were biologically given such a gift after all those years of evolution. So when you're trying to run through your nose, particularly the first few times, you want to stay in that zone. Easily enough, can you talk in a full sentence? If you can, you're probably there. So, little thought there. Can you talk in a, a full sentence? Yes or no? But then, 
obviously we wouldn't recommend actually trying to have a conversation because that would mean you're not nasal breathing. Yeah, anymore. no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of people do running groups and I think they're very fantastic, great social opportunity and getting yeah. out there. And I, I mean, you're going to speak through your mouth. If you can speak through your nose, you're a talented man, <laughs> talented woman. <laughs> Record a video <laughs> yeah. and send it to us. Um, but in that instance, I would still recommend breathing through your nose, even if you're having a chat. Now, yeah. if you're by yourself, then yes, you want to be, you're probably not talking to yourself, I imagine, <laughs> but yeah, you're trying to keep that nasal, constant nasal breathing in and out, again, as the baseline measure with running, keeping your heart rate low and just running for a longer period of time. Because when you start running faster, you're getting that sort of nasal burn and feeling the, the panting come on through your mm-hmm. mouth, it becomes more taxing. Yeah. And what we know from the research is there is not much gain to be had in that moderate intensity zone relative to doing high intensity stuff. You're better off going and the, the model I teach people is 80, 20, 80% as a minimum in that lower zone, which is what we spoke about in the running podcast, 20% in that high intensity. Moderate intensity can be very good, can be very, very useful, but for a majority of people, they spend too long there and they're not polarizing their training. So they're really, they're running their car at say five, 6,000 revs all the time mm. they're not going down to two and they're not mm. really going up to seven or eight they're just sitting there yeah uh, and that itself is a problem for both mechanical efficiency and metabolic clearance and etc yeah. so i think if you use that talk test that again you've done all the breathing up into the point of balance you've started nasal breathing with running i think that's what, again you've really done a big couple of ticks there and then the part that we were talking about last week which I don't know if I introduced it to or if you'd heard it previously, is how is the best way to sort of breathe with each step or each run, mm. right? So No, I hadn't heard this one before. So, so th- it gets a little bit more like tricky and it's not something I start with for most people because I don't want it to be a barrier for entry, but timing of your breathing is very individual at the start. Like everyone has a different capacity to tolerate CO2. Mm. So some people will want to breathe faster than others. But what you find is if you're breathing, and let's just go for the example, every two steps. So I land on my left, land on my right. That's a breath in. I breathe out in the opposite pattern. You're always breathing in and breathing out sort of at the same time. So when you're exhaling, you might find there's a different type of stability compared to when you're inhaling. Because we know when you have that full inhalation, you've got your intra-abdominal pressure, you're going to transmit the force up the leg a lot better into the trunk. So what is a very useful tool is to try and breathe in terms of steps I've got a three, two basis. You know, you can breathe in for three steps out for two, mm-hmm. right? What it means is with running, it becomes an effective method because you're breathing in for more steps than you're breathing out. So you're going to have a bit more stability and you're actively breathing out within that two steps. So you're getting your abs on, you're still helping transmit the force, just not as efficiently. Mm-hmm. And you can change that to like a two, one method. Um, and you can even try doing it the other way where you're breathing in for two out for three. It's up to the person, but you just don't want to always be breathing one, two, one, two, one, two, where possible. As in like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you just... Yeah. And again, it's just coming with how you're landing on that leg each time. And we know like if you go to land, most people are going to take the breath in and land, right? And you can kind of see no one really breathes out and lands. You breathe out as you spring. Mm. So, and that's not necessarily going to happen every step because it would be too rapid and wouldn't be super efficient. So... To combat that, people have just observed. I don't know if there's any data out there research-wise, but there's all in terms of like, do does everyone do it naturally or not? Mm. But I know from just like the this coaching perspective, particularly, is observe your own breath whilst you're running. So bring your breath awareness from the ground into running, and then see how it feels. Um, probably like you take it to swimming, for example. Everyone does a different style of um, breath in swimming. Some do two strokes, three strokes, even up to four. If you watch right. Ariane Titmus. And they find their own way of being efficient. Yeah. The idea is that you, you're you going to be different to the next person for a host of reasons. But again, understand the idea. Just try not to go in, in, out, out the whole time because it's just not necessarily going to be as efficient. Okay. And what about... Because... <clears throat> I think in breath, James Nestor talks about they were doing some tests with, uh, I think they were doing cycling, but they were focusing on the 6-6, weren't they? The 6-in, 6-out, and found that, is there a benefit to 
increasing your exhalation period as well. Um, I mean, I think so. I guess it depends how much carbon dioxide you're producing, how yeah. fast you're going and, and what your tolerance is. And, but. and this is where I think it gets very individual because yeah. um, with carbon dioxide tolerance, some people might not be able to tolerate it. So when they get to running, they're going to not be able to breathe out slower. It just won't happen. And yeah. you don't want that to be a barrier for entry for people. Um, in terms of carbon dioxide tolerance, and what that actually means is effectively when you're exercising or even at your rest, you're always producing carbon dioxide as a waste product, hence why we blow it out. The reason some people breathe more rapidly is that they can't tolerate the buildup of CO2 in the body, so then they want to get it out. Unfortunately, that sort of then makes the sensors a little more susceptible to going, oh, well, we've got to start getting a bit more sensitive because we're blowing mm. off too much and then it's a vicious yeah, cycle. Because if you blow off too much too much carbon dioxide, it's not just a waste gas, it actually does help with oxygen utilisation in the yeah. cells. So you, you need you, to have a, good, a decent amount in, or an appropriate amount of carbon yeah. dioxide. And as we get higher in exercise intensity or duration, you'll produce more carbon dioxide and you do want to blow it out. Yeah. That is a thing. You don't want to keep all of it in there. So what we try to advise is stick at that level where you're sort of building up and ex- like to a point where you can maintain for a long period of time and it just happens to be called zone two at the moment is mm, what it's called mm. in the literature and you can kind of get away with in and out through your nose really comfortably yeah and that's not to say when you get to a more intense exercise say for sprinting or you're doing speed work or hill repeats or something yep yeah, at some point you'll breathe out through your mouth there's no yeah. doubt because you've got to get rid of the excessive carbon dioxide the more that you can go through your nose there will be a genetic capping point for every person, but the more you can push that boundary, the more efficient you can keep your run for longer. Yeah. I think that's a very important yeah. point. And I've been, I think something that's really helped me is I used to run to, well, I do hear still here and there, but I used to run to music, but having some runs without music has helped me really like listen to the breath and use that as feedback. And I've actually been trying to, control it more so it's more silent like obviously silent nasal breathing is what you want day to day um and obviously there's going to be a point at which you can't remain silent um but would you do you reckon trying to have controlled silent nasal breathing for as long as possible in the run is a good thing i'm going to give you an example and see what your brain does if you're walking around yeah and you're trying to breathe, and I'm banging together pots and pans constantly, are you really going to focus on what you're doing or the sound? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? So whilst music is very enjoyable, and we know there's some great research to suggest it can help you run at certain cadences and speeds, it's going to distract you from having more interception. Yeah. And that's a big part of what we try to, like you and I now, sort of movement philosophy is understand yourself first, right? Because once you set that baseline, yeah, sure, use some music. There's nothing wrong with music. Yeah. But I think people haven't set the baseline to understand this is how I'm moving and feeling. So when you put the music in, you just you're running sort of nah, blase about it. That's when you're gonna probably be more likely to hurt yourself because you're not tuning in with yourself regularly or at all. You're yeah. just zoned out. And say if you get a hot spot or a sore spot pop up, you're more likely to push through because you're like, ah, oh, it's fine. I'll just keep pushing through. And the music's pumping you up. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's yeah. just I. I have nothing against listening to music or podcasts with running. It's a great way to learn stuff and listen to music and zone out. But I do think that people should probably get a baseline first before you ever do that. And I, again, I'm a big fan of meditating. I meditate every day and I running to me is meditative because it's no music. It's focusing on breathing and for the 30 to hour that I do it for, you sort of just, you're in the zone. You're, you're not thinking about everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I've been really enjoying that. And it is like a meditation when you focus, like obviously breathing is such a big focus in a lot of different meditation styles and going for a run and actually trying to control your breathing. It takes a lot of focus. You can't, as soon as you lose focus, you realize that your breathing is off. And, and that's what I love about, not having music is I hear the breathing go off and I'm like, oh, okay, whoop, back to the breath. And, and, oh yes. Yeah, and that's what I was saying in terms of silent and controlled. Like my understanding is the, like the, say the fittest, most elite athlete, the fittest, most elite runner, them going for a run, like, a, you know, zone two run around, you'd imagine their breathing would be super controlled, pretty much silent, and they're just in control, like they're, oh, they're in the zone the whole time, super calm. And yeah. so 
what I've been doing is trying to maintain that silent, controlled, calm breathing and and then I'm probably going too fast, but and then <laughs> walking when I start to feel like I'm going <sighs> and and then obviously I have been pushing through a little bit with that, but then as soon as my mouth needs to come into it, then I'm like, okay, I'm going too fast or I've gone too hard. And now then I walk to regain my breathing control. And then once I feel like my breathing control is regained, then I start going again. Which is exactly to your point. You probably wouldn't do that with music because you wouldn't be aware of it. So it's really hard to make that behavioral change. Yeah. And well, with the music, mm. I've, I, I usually just go hard when the music's yeah. pumping and yeah. then when it's a lull, then I just walk. <laughs> gets Beethoven on, he just gets yeah. into a bit of a zone. <laughs> yeah. But, and like, I think that's one of these uh, habitual habit formations that we've created. Um, I don't know if it's across the world. I just know it seems to be across Brisbane specifically that if I don't, if I go for a run and I don't sweat and I feel exhausted, I haven't run properly, mm. which is such a misnomer because yeah. if you go for a zone two run, you're sending a signal to your body that I want to get better at aerobic conditioning. I'm not sending mixed signals. I'm not over fatiguing it. I just want to get good at being aerobic. So the body goes, okay, in the background, the things that we can't feel and process, it's doing that. Mm. And then it, it might not feel like you've done much, but in actuality, if you've done it at the right intensity for a long enough time, then yeah, then all of a sudden it's sort of, it will do what it needs to do and you won't realize it. And the only way you end up doing it is so like, I think we want data. You, you do yourself a test, whether that be a time trial or, you know, some other type of running test or cycling test or whatever, do it for like six weeks, test it again. And what you will find is aerobically you've, will have improved if you've done enough sessions and you've done you know your zone two really well and you've kept your fatigue low and at no point did you ever try and run race pace Mm, mm. like because you didn't need to because your body you'll just get better across time and you'll bring up the basement effectively the ceiling will get better the more you can push and that's where that high intensity training the strength training becomes very important yeah but we want to bring up the base because it's going to minimize your risk of injury and also just increase your enjoyment because you're not feeling as stressed and fatigued with your running. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah, so I've got I've got a lot of practice to do and, and like I've really only been practicing properly over the last few weeks and even more recently like realizing the importance of not just being uh, a slave to the music. <laughs> um, well, let's put out the TFC challenge because yeah. you and I have got like a, a year challenge here. Yeah, yeah. And Max in as well. Oh, so Max in, yeah. yes. So, all right. So, let's go. What, 5K time, was it? Five five kilometers, sub 20 minutes. Yeah, basically. so that's that's what we're after. But what we're trying to do is, well, if you can achieve it already, then good, you're pretty fit. I think you're in like the top 5% of the world actually is what is that, that right? Yeah, something like that. Oh, jeez. Because uh, you got to think there's a lot of people in the world who aren't running. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah fair. So... Yeah, that, that's that point. But we want to try and be able to do it nasal, efficient, and feeling good afterwards. Yeah. Which, that's why we've given it a year to yeah. do it, to give a plenty of time. So, if anyone wants to join in on that challenge, yeah, shoot a, shoot a like, shoot a message to James. Yeah, yeah. Let us know because we... We'll, we'll, we'll document things mm. along the way. We'll probably do a, a podcast or two um, along the way for our, like just talking about the process and the journey and things that we've found as have been good and things that we've struggled with. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to join along, that'd be, that'd be great. Mm. But, um, yeah, the, the key thing there is, yeah, we're not just bashing out a 5k sprint. We want to be feeling calm in control, nasal breathing, feeling good afterwards. And I, the, the other thing that I'm really interested to start playing with is breath holds in running. Cause when mm. I first read the oxygen advantage, um, like, fair few years ago now i started doing the walks with breath holding and and really enjoyed that and that's a really cool meditation as well obviously you don't have to be running you can still do your walking just without music or podcasts and focus on your breathing that's an awesome meditation and then you can add in breath hold so holding your breath for as long as for as many steps as you can for as long as you can but the breath, the next breath in has to be silent and controlled as well. So you're not going. <clears throat> so I'm pretty keen. Well, when I was doing that, I was like, oh, this is awesome. But I don't know how I would ever apply this to running. But now I'm starting, I'm almost starting to feel like it's yeah. plausible, which so, obviously it is plausible. Well, I mean, yeah. So for anyone who hasn't tried it, the whole idea of doing the breath hold and walk or the breath hold and running is I'm going to send the two scientific terms and explain them hypo, uh, hypercapnic and hypoxic. 
So the first one is that hypercapnia. It's when you've got that elevated amount of CO2 in your body. So that's that CO2 tolerance. So you're learning or trying to learn how to tolerate higher amounts of CO2 in your body, which as you exercise harder and you get more CO2, it means that you're not going to be breathing as rapidly. So you're going to keep your breathing in a more efficient rate. That's the general idea with Mm -hmm. that part. The second part is hypoxic. So you're trying to almost mimic altitude training. And then why is that important? You're trying to use less oxygen and whilst being efficient. So it's kind of like, you know, there's a certain amount of calories that you need to eat to sustain an activity. We're trying to use the least amount of oxygen required to to be optimal with our performance. Mm. And by doing the breath hold with walking, you you sort of build those two up. And like you said, it's very meditative because when you're doing breath holds for anyone who's done it, you really have to be focused. Mm -hmm. You can't be distracted because you start feeling tingling around your body. You start feeling all these weird sensations. And if you do it for too long, you can pass out. So please don't try to go for that unless you've had some experience. But it's very useful as you then increase the intensity of your runs or the duration of your runs because it's going to just keep your brain more allowed to be free, less, oh, and more, I'm calm, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how we, we go in the next year doing it because, you know, I do it three times a week with the breath holds and then... With walking or running? Uh, just walking. Yeah. So, at the moment, it's like Tuesday, Thursday and one one of the weekend days. I'll do three to five of those in a row Yeah. Um, just to practice. And it's gotten a lot better, even like the, the cold version. First thing in the morning when I do it, I've gotten it up to like baseline 50 steps. Yeah. It's like right. a, a very good start. And for anyone who wants to try, like between 80 and 100 steps is really good. Mm. So, there's a fair bit of work still to be done to get there, but... Yeah. It's a slow game. The fitter you are, the it correlates with being a bit easier. So Yeah. Yeah, so I think that to summarize all of that, obviously which is a hard job, but the cool thing is that if you're a runner or if you're already a runner and you may have already built up some bad habits of mouth breathing and overstriding and all these inefficiencies, or if you're just someone who has never really run, either way you need to kind of start from scratch and build up gradually with good technique and efficient nasal breathing. And it's a very cool opportunity to tie those two together and really only do as much volume as you can maintain nasal breathing is a, is a good thing to aim for. I, I think it's, it's a very good starting place. It's, and yeah. it's like... And intense volume and intensity. Why I love running more than probably any other exercise, and they all do it, is like it is it's a build up across time. Like you can't just go out and run and become really good at running. Like you can't just go and squat 200 kilos. Like you have to put a bit of time in and a bit of effort to get there. And that's why you see all these people who are at the Olympics at the moment. They weren't just running last year. They've all been running for years upon years. They've just stacked the work to become athletes at that elite level. And that's what I like about it. Like it's a build wherever you start now, that's still good. You're starting. Mm. Yeah, you can get better, but we all can. Yeah, don't be stressed about it. Get excited because. And even if you feel like you have to re, it's there's a pr- concept of regress to progress. Because mm. if you're like, oh, I'm, but I can already run ten k's, and now if I shut my mouth and I change my style, then I can only do two k's. And yeah. it's like, well, good. Yeah, two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. Well, whoever whoever started that, I think, was onto that idea that yeah. to ever make progress, there's always going to be hurdles that are, you're going to have to change certain things, but. It, you will see the benefit if you stick with it's doing a long it. Game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah, I think a lot of, especially runners, like people who are like identify as a runner, yeah. they really care about their volume, and they're like, oh, I can't, I can't. Like, I'm doing 70 k's a week. I can't drop back down to five k's a week. Um, it's like, well, it's, you know, it's obviously always yeah. a choice. But if you want to improve your efficiency, um, improve your performance, reduce your risk of injuries then it's probably a good idea to wind back and build back up. And uh, my, so this is like what I tell people and like it's the, it's the gamble. Like if you run at a speed that you can tolerate through your nose, you're going to be at a closer position that your body can maintain like the mechanical stress of yeah. running. Yeah. And I gamble with people, still haven't lost it, that if you do running through your nose only and you don't force it, you're probably not going to get injured. Yeah. Now, there are, there are reasons you could, <laughs> but I still haven't had anyone in clinic get injured doing it because it is very self-regulating. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part that's, to it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're, we're really big on is self-regulation. It's, we're not going to tell you, you can't, you can't possibly tell any big group of people, this is the way you should do it. This is the exact progression. It's like, you need to listen to your body. 
You need to tune into the signals it's giving you. You need to respect that there's a process of gradual transition. Whatever that, that's going to look different for everyone, but it's up to you really. No one can listen to your body like you can. Yeah, no, 100%. And that is it's such an important point because your feet and how they interact with the ground affects what happens at your diaphragm. Mm. So it affects how you breathe. And vice versa. Some, yeah. yeah, some people don't see that connection because it's not very obvious, but you and I have mucked with it so many times. Like it becomes very obvious. And the more that you're aware of that and the way that you're interacting with the world around you, you find that you see everything a bit differently, mm. which is really cool because then you know, running's more enjoyable, life's more enjoyable. You actually feel like you're making progress and the little setbacks are like, no, there's a, there's a grand plan here. I'm trying to go to this goal and I can see how I'm getting there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, well, I think we can pretty much wrap it up there. Yeah, I think um, so. We'll ch- yeah, like we said, we'll chuck some of those things in the show notes and we'll probably do a follow-up or two. Um, and definitely once we've got a, a winner. Yeah. <laughs> Is it yeah. a competition? Or- yeah, it's a competition. Yeah, uh, it's a competition. Look, you got to have a bit of friendly competition. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just not as fun. Yeah. But if anyone wants to join, seriously, send a message through because, yeah. you know, we'd... I, you know, we could create a little leaderboard. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. I reckon yeah. let's do it. We've all got Stra- Strava's easy. Exactly. Unless yeah. it messes can up. Can we make at the groups bridge. on Strava? Uh, probably. Yeah, yeah, TFC running group. Yeah, let's do it. All right, sweet. All right. We're on. <laughs> We're on. All right. Well, thanks for listening, guys. And we'll catch you next week. Adios. Adios.